Hi everyone, thanks for joining me today. Uh, we're gonna go over uh, native plants and cultivation, uh, mainly in the 10 County Central Florida area. I guess before we get started on what's commercially available at our native plant nurseries, let's, I'm gonna go over a few plants that are not in cultivation, meaning that we have a lot of species in Central Florida that just cannot be grown in a nursery setting. Once you take them out of their, their normal ecosystem soils and surroundings and companion plants, they just don't do well, it's hard to grow them. Uh, or you have plants like thistle, which is the, probably one of the most beneficial plants we have in terms of feeding insects and butterflies. But a lot of people consider it a nuisance plant and it's not available. Of course, there's our beautiful terrestrial orchids that we have in Florida. Again, they're very specialized and very difficult to grow in cultivation. And of course, there's our little microscopic plants. We have the little sundews. We have bladder warts that, that are plant material that thrive under the ground and, and uh, feed underground. Uh, we have pitcher plants. We have lupin, which has you know, a fibrous taproot that goes you know, 12 to 18 feet. These plants just cannot physically be grown in cultivation. We used to have some on the UCF campus and all around Central Florida, we used to have some of the oldest uh, Florida pine rosemary scrub um, in the Southeast United States. UCF campus had rosemary shrubs as tall as 15 to 18 feet, which means they were probably hundreds of years old. So I guess why I wanted to share that with you is because of the 550 plants that are native to Central Florida, only a fraction are actually available for developers, homeowners, and public and governments to actually purchase and plant in the ground. So it's incredibly important we get as many native plants out there as possible uh, to feed our native insects, our native birds, our native butterflies, and other pollinators and other wildlife. So while you're considering planting native plants, just keep in mind low impact design considerations, you know, limit your turf, uh, make sure that you leave some snags on site and, you know, plan out your, your garden well so that it looks um, coordinated, uh, low things in front, make sure the landscaping is layered, which it works best for you know, wildlife and ecology kind of mimicking what goes on in nature. And then also keep in mind, not every square inch needs to be planted with plants and ground cover. You really need to concentrate on leaving some areas of soil so that those uh, solitary bees and wasps that burrow into the soil and butterflies and moths can um, uh, take up minerals in the soil that they're used to. So we'll start off with some native ground covers that are available in native plant nurseries. Now, at the end of this presentation, I'm going to give you a listing of native plant nurseries that are available right in our area. But wherever you're from, there are 44 states in the United States that have native plant societies, and they also have resources on where to find native plant nurseries. In Florida, it's the Florida Association of Native Plant Nurseries, FANN.org. Just type in your zip code and it'll come up with all of the native plant nurseries in your area. And I will tell you that wherever you go, they're very helpful. They'll walk you through everything, teach you about native plants and tell you, you know, what's available to plant in your yard. So Mimosa strigillosa is a ground cover. It's, it's not what I would consider a turf substitute because it does kind of go dormant in the winter. Um, it, you can see the ground through it, um, but it is an excellent plant for bees. Um, so it's always nice to have a little patch of that. The next ground cover I highly recommend, Phylonata flora, a common name is frog fruit. It's, it, it, it can get up to, in, in some conditions, you know, eight to 10 inches tall, but then you just mow it a couple of times a year. It stays very uniform. It looks just like turf and it can blend in with your turf. Um, very easy to maintain. It spreads on rhizomes like St. Augustine turf. This is a plant, a native plant that I would consider what I call a turf substitute. Um, and they're available in very large quantities everywhere. 
Um, these are all the butterflies you can feed with frog's fruit. It takes a lot of foot traffic. It's just a really uh, tough and, and ecologically valuable uh, ground cover to use. Now, dichondra is, is available in native plant nurseries. Not a lot of people think about dichondra because it kind of grows in some specialized conditions. It really needs a little bit of moisture and it needs shade. Um, semi-shade to deep shade. It actually does best in some deep shade. So if you have some really large shade trees with a lot of shade, this is your plant. Um, and if you're in a dry area, you're going to have to irrigate it because it does like a little bit of moisture. Now, this is another what I would call turf substitute, basket grass. You can see how low to the ground it is in that photo on the left, but it literally will look like a lawn. However, it will go completely dormant in winter and not just dormant, the plant will literally disappear and will not come back until the springtime. So not an ideal plant for a front yard, but if you have some large expanses, um, this is a plant that will grow well in areas that maybe are not so upfront. Now, goldenrod is a beautiful plant and a huge pollinator feeder. Um, the Solidago sempervirens gets very tall. I use it as a backdrop. It can get up to eight feet tall. Uh, so this is a, a really good backdrop. Out of nature, you'll need to take little thin bamboo strips and kind of tie it up a little bit. I use thin bamboo because you can't really see it. Um, and to kind of help them stand up because they're so tall. Now, Solidago, Odorata is a shorter uh, variety that I use probably more, a little bit more often. Twin flower is a you know beautiful little plant. It's um, very again all of these any native plant you plant is going to be high ecological ecologically with food and nesting for for birds and wildlife. But th these some of these plants are higher than others. Now the twin flower the dicors Christy, the oblogifolia is more of the dry soil plant. The humus strata is not planted as often. It takes a little bit more moist soils. It does take some, it can live in variable uh, soils, but it has a tiny white bloom, not as popular. Um, but so those are the two species of twin flower. Now, again, twin flower. Um, tends to go a little bit dormant, but it's just what a beautiful surprise in the springtime when that comes up and blossoms. And you can see on the left, it has a really beautiful rounded shape. It tends to be more herbaceous than woody um, and, you know, with beautiful, you know, blooms on that. Now I'm going to get into some milk plants, um, you know, commonly referred to as milkweeds. I'm trying to start a revolution to get the word weed out of our most precious native plants. Um, this is Asclepias incarnata. It's the tallest of them it, due to its common name, a swamp milk plant is what I call it. Um, tends to take a little bit more uh, moist soils. You can't tell from this photo, this is an up close photo of the bloom, but it's a pretty tall, I would say like three to three and a half foot stalk. Um, the butterflies love it, of course. This is Asclepias perennis, a nice, you know, white bloom. And this is probably the most popular is the Asclepias tuberosa. It's about one to two feet, um, bright orange color. Loves full sun, so it grows easier in, um, in a lot of different places. For my milk plants, I have a milk plant garden. I put them, I mix all of the species together in one big area. Now, these plants from a formal, you know, traditional landscaping neighbor point of view, they'll look a little messy at certain times of the year, but that's okay. We have to let it go through its natural life cycle. What we can do is plant small little shrubs, evergreen shrubs, in an undulating border around it. So your eye goes to that frame, if you will, and it keeps our native, you know, wildflowers and milk plants, you know, looking a little tidy if we have them in public view. And of course, you know, um, bunch them together, uh, giving them, a, you know, a little bit of space so they have their own, you know, root system in the soil, but clumping them together makes, you know, beautiful, you know, outdoor bouquets. This is Asclepias verticilla. I always have a hard time with that species. 
verticillata. Thank you, Val. Um, this is available right now at your native plant nurseries. It's a really beneficial plant. It's again, it's a, one of the smaller ones. I put it in front so that you have um, layers of milk plants and then just watch the activity take over. So um, this moves us into the aster family. The Coreopsis, which is our state wildflower, um, again, attracts a lot of pollinators, it, more so insects than butterflies. But again, insects are the primary food source of our, native, our bird population. So we want to attract as many insects as possible. So we have Coreopsis lanceolata. Now, this plant will keep that evergreen basil rosette all year long. It doesn't bloom all year long, but it is a long bloomer. Now, Coreops, oops, I thought I had a picture of Coreopsis lanceolata. That might come later. The other species of Coreopsis um, is Leavenworthii, and that's a little taller of a plant, a little bit more open, loose, spindly habit, and then it has um, a, a darker center on the aster flower, and that's the um, Coreopsis Leavenworthii. And that does kind of, I won't say disappear, but kind of goes through more of a dormant stage than this species, Lanceolata. This is another Elliot's aster, another really nice plant for the landscape, um, a lot of high wildlife value. And now this, I consider it a ground cover. I don't know where you're gonna put a cacti and what kind of category, but I put it in a ground cover because it doesn't really get that tall. But this is one of our only cacti species um, in Florida and just take a look at that bloom. I saw one in nature one time that had 32 blooms on it. It was a very mature specimen. It was probably almost three feet tall, which they rarely get and very wide. Um, and just an awesome, you know, of course, if you have children or ambitious pets, you know, this might not be the plant for your backyard, but if you have a sunny condition, I mean, just an excellent species. Gopher tortoises will sit and wait and sit by these plants when the fruits are blooming and just wait for it to drop. Um, um, pine lilies, maybe not so, it, they're, they're hard to find and they're kind of a little bit difficult to grow, but pine lilies are, you know, beautiful, beautiful plant, you know, for a different uh, uh, texture and color in your garden. The Gallardia is kind of a tried and true, right? It's, it, it will withstand urban conditions. Um, it takes variable soil. It reseeds readily. Um, I highly recommend this, at least for different patches in your yard. And um, just one or two of these plants is all you need. If you take care of it, water it, and make sure the mulch is not too thick so that the seeds, when mature, can reach the soil, this plant will reseed readily every year for you. And then we have our salvia. Salvia coccinea, this is a really important wildlife plant. There are certain, the green link spider will uh, lay their eggs and mate in the dead blooms of the scarlet sage. You know, you know, our biologists tell us this and our botanists tell us, it's just really fascinating. When you think about native plants, it's not just the bloom, right? Because that's what the non-native plants are for. You know, there's kind of like eye candy. They have zero ecological value. But it's just amazing to me with our native ground covers and native plants that the bloom is important, the leaves are important. Every little part of it has a part in nature and everything is important. And keep in mind when you are planting plants, when the blooms go dormant is not the time to snip them or deadhead them. Let them go through their natural life cycle because sometimes the seeds take a while to ripen and the bloom may be deteriorating a little bit. But you, so you don't want to do any type of pruning until the next season. For instance, I'll get to an, a really good example, but you know, Stokes Aster, when the bloom stalk is done, you know, it'll be the dead stalk on there for a while, but just leave it be. When it, the next season, when you can lightly touch it and pluck it out, that's when you want to maintain it, take it out when it comes out naturally. Um, there's some white blooms, the penstemon um, that go well, you know, they tend to spread a lot and, you know, may look a little leggy at times, but these are wonderful plants, the, the Tampa verbena. 
has a really nice bloom. This is a close up. They're actually a lot smaller and, and not, not as full as this uh, typically. Um, and I have had um, uh, experiences with this plant that it's a little finicky, but other people grow it really well. But it's a nice kind of small to medium height plant again for a ground cover garden. Now this, the scorpion's tail, this will get to be a, a pretty big uh, sprawling shrubby mound uh, about two and a half feet tall. And just look at that really unique spiral bloom on it, giving it its common name. Uh, very interesting in the landscape. It really likes a lot of shade. It will, it will not, it's, it, it, the nurseries tell you it's, you know, a very variable plant. It depends on how it's grown. Um, my experience with this plant is that it does not like full sun. It likes, prefers that dappled shade. Now, this is one of my favorite plants. This is um, the Ruelia carolinianus. This is, um, it comes up every year in the spring. Again, another one of those plants that kind of gives you a really nice surprise. They do reseed readily. Um, we have a really bad plant. The, Ru the Ruelia bretoniana is a, an invasive plant. People call it the Mexican petunia. It's a taller shrub with a little darker, but same uh, conical shape to the bloom. It's just a horrible invasive. Um, unfortunately, it's still legal to sell them. So I just want to mention, if you ever see Mexican petunia, stay away from it. It's not, not a good plant. So I have this uh, yucca filamentosa in here as just kind of an example to share with you all. There are some creatures like the yucca moth. They only have one or two plants that they can feed off of. And so that plant is pollinated by maybe one or two insects. So it's a very close relationship. So again, the more we can plant native plants, the more we can support our insect community, which then those insects can more support our bird populations and thwart off um, extirpation or extinction. So this is a really small plant, it could, some situations gets a little large, but it's a very, very delicate bloom. You can see the scale by the size of this bee on it. It's a very, very tiny bloom. But again, we, you know, we want to go for that range of blooms and seeds because there are some insects that are specialized to go on these really tiny blooms. There are some other insects that are specialized to go on to larger blooms. So in your garden, I would just always have a variety. Now, Berlandaria, the green eyes, is, is a, a really beautiful little plant. Um, it likes very, very dry conditions. If you plant this plant in an area where it gets a lot of irrigation, it's not going to like it. Um, on our native plants like a specific amount of water and uh, to be happy. Uh, this is an interesting ground cover, go for apple. And of course it has huge wildlife value, again, because of the fruits on it. Um, if you live in a subdivision and, or if you wanna cover a large area of land, this is a plant for you. You can see by the photo, it stays kind of procumbent and low growing, has some beautiful blooms. Uh, but I will tell you, this does tend to get a little bit invasive. It kind of takes off sometimes. So sometimes you have to, uh, uh, keep this plant in check. Um, but again, it, sometimes it gets a little leggy, but uh, just a wonderful, beautiful, unique specimen. Um, if anybody wants a copy of this uh, PDF uh, presentation, they can contact me at the Pine Lily chapter, which um, my uh, contact information is on that website. So now we come to, we have, it's called the vanilla plant or paintbrush, it's called Carpheferous. This is one of, this is a really beautiful striking plant. Again, it's a basil rosette. It stays pretty low. And then when it blooms, it sends up the bloom stalks. The corombosis is, uh, I guess, a little bit more readily popular and it grows in all types of dry soils and the odoratissimus um, takes a little bit more moist soils. But a uh, really beautiful textured bloom on this plant. And then Chrysopsis, um, you know, it's really exciting when you run across these plants in their natural surroundings, you know, and, and keep that in mind, you know, non-native plants, you know, that, you know, 
they're not from here. You know, they could be from Southeast Asia, from India. You know, you'll never see them in nature. This is when we're planting native plants, we're bringing nature to our own backyards. And, and when you do that, when you plant it, they will come. I mean, just take a look at this really interesting looking sweat bee. Um, you'll see all sorts of interesting um, insects to, to um, enjoy. So the scabrella, the Chrysopsis scabrella is um, more of the, uh, I guess, variable to a little bit of moist soil. The uh, Chrysopsis subulata is more of a scrubby plant and, and, and it blooms a completely different type time of year than the scabrella or the Mariana. So you could typically, you could, and here's the Mariana here, the next slide here, here's the Chrysopsis Mariana. So you could have all three of these species together in your landscape and they will bloom at different times even though they're from the same genus, which is kind of a nice effect and you can have blooms all year long. So this is a must for any native plant landscape is the partridge pea. It just, it, the, the leaves, the blooms, it's, it's just ecologically very valuable and it's very beautiful. It's, um, and then, Biden's alba, it depends on who you talk to. Some people just really do not like this plant because um, a common name for it is beggar tick. It has the little um, seed pods that kind of stick to your clothing, but it's the most prolific pollinator feeder there is. This plant will spread, it will reseed readily. It'll kind of get a little out of control. How I use this plant is I reserve a really big area of it in my backyard and just let it go. And you will be amazed to walk out there. That, that's all you have to do is have some a, a little area of Biden's Alba and you can go back in your backyard and be a, a, back, a citizen scientist and just look at all of the little tiny pollinators that this thing will feed, um, in, including skippers, um, moths, butterflies. It, it's just basically feeds everything. It's probably one of the most uh, valuable native plants that there are. And um, you do have to keep it in check, but I think the beggar ticks are worth it, worth it. You know, when they start coming out, you can cut them off um, and, um, and move forward with that. Um, this Stochesia laevis, uh, this is um, a really beautiful plant. It'll send up multiple bloom stalks at once. It's got a little, you know, base to it. It gets it really thick. And if, if you've never seen, I've, I've talked to a few people who've had this experience. I actually saw a bumblebee. They, they take naps during the day in the beds of flowers. They kind of take a rest and take a nap. And I saw one waking up from a nap and just taking, it was just completely still in one minute. And then it just kind of was stretching its limbs and then stretching its wings. And then it kind of finally flew off after a couple of minutes, but it's kind of another kind of an interesting experience you can have with native plants. Um, this plant likes a little bit of dappled shade. Um, you really have to check when you're buying native plants at the nursery that are in cultivation, you really have to check for the sun conditions and the soil conditions. Don't just buy any native plant and plant it anywhere. This, this plant will suffer in the uh, full sun. And then here's yellow top, um, uh, a nice contrast with some of our more purple and blue blooms. Um, now, Laetris, we have several different species. We have Laetris spicata, gracilis, tenufolia, chetmanii, and each one of them has a, it's the same linear uh, panicle of purple blooms, but some of them have a really wide panicle. Some of them are thin. The gracilis, like the name, it's very feathery compared to the other ones. Um, it's kind of fun to put together the different species in one little area uh, to see the contrasts of the blooms come up. Uh, this is Pityopsis um, graminifolia. It, it's not, it doesn't reseed as readily as the other plants, but it's a, a pretty tough uh, plant, reliable plant for blooming. This is the only violet we have in Florida. This little native, um, it's a tiny little plant. It only grows maybe to four inches, but planted in a mass in a very deep shade with just the right amount of um, moisture. 
Um, this is just a beautiful little ground cover. Now it doesn't really reseed readily like a lot of the other ones. So you kind of have to plant a mass of them, but they're, they're just gorgeous. But, and this plant doesn't just take dappled shade. It needs complete dark shade um, to be happy. And everybody knows our black eyed Susans. And then this is another one of my favorites. Uh, the day flower kind of opens up each morning and closes in the afternoon. Uh, wonderful for bees um, and other poll pollinators. And just the variable color of the of the blooms, um, which they'll change with age um, and just very striking uh, herbaceous wildflower. Um, the rosin plants. The different species, we've got the asteriscus and the compotatum and the integrifolium. Now, the different species, again, will have the different heights. Uh, this can be a very, very tall plant. I'm talking like five to six feet at the top of the bloom stalk um, down to like, like a two foot bloom stalk. And again, this is kind of one of the musts if you want to uh, feed pollinators. Another similar plant, with different species with the different heights is their veronia. And the veronia, the fasciculata is kind of the lo more lower growing. The bloom panicle has a very feathery texture and you can see the bottom part of it is kind of you know open and, and leggy, which kind of opens it up for a nice opportunity to plant something else lower uh, below it so you can have two colors together. Uh, this is the larger Veronia gigantea, um, and that got a good five feet tall. And so again, maybe a nice little background color plant. And then um, the Penny Royal is again, more of a dry scrub plant, uh, but once all, the mass, the little, it, it's a, got a very unique texture to it. It's kind of got the, a spiky um, uh, stalks, but once you have like 30 of them all together, it looks very, you know, uh, feathery, especially with the, with the bloom tips on there. Very, very unique plant. And here's the Lanceolata, again, different view. And then here's the Leavenworthy eye. It has, remember I was saying earlier, it has kind of a more of a leggy uh, base to the plant. You can see that here. And then of course our wonderful rain lilies. Shirley Denton took this photo on the left. These are um, absolutely beautiful. The one on the right, of course, is a photo from nature, but I used to have these in my front yard in downtown Orlando, and they start coming up and bloom in the first rain of the springtime, the first rains of the, uh, the wet season, and irrigation will not trick it. Scientists think it's the ozone in the rain that triggers it to grow and bloom. And um, again, it's, it's, this is one of the only bulb type plants we have in Florida. It is a bulb and, um, and they tend to all come up out of the ground all at the same time every year. Again, you know, a wonderful spring surprise in your garden. Um, uh, this of the prolific pollinator feeders, this is the most prolific in my opinion. The Mon Monarda punctata feeds from little tiny microscopic uh, insects to the very large bumblebees and everything in between. Um, um, just a museum of insects that are attracted to this plant and just look at it. It looks like it comes from Mars. I mean you can't get a more unique and beautiful bloom than um, the dotted horseman. And uh, this is uh, readily available at any nursery. And then the coral bean is very unique. Um, the seeds can be poisonous if you eat enough of them. The, this is the Erythrina herbaceae. Um, it's a hummingbird plant and you know very unique, um, very drought tolerant. And I'll just go over a couple of our native ferns. This is the bracken fern. It likes really moist soils, but I just love that feathery texture. And then of course, everybody knows the cinnamon fern. Again, kind of in more swampy, moist soils. So you really got to pick the right spot for this. Um, they are available and just look at that close up. It's just, the color is just phenomenal. And then the couplet fern, you know, again, a completely different uh, um, bipinnation of this uh, fern. I guess they're not leaves on ferns. 
um, but just just extraordinary uniqueness. And then here is the the chain fern uh, that can grow. If you have just a little bit of shade, this plant will thrive. And then I just wanted to take two seconds to talk about bromeliads. Let's not forget about our native air plants. They are available um, and make sure they're native when you buy them. But these are beautiful to watch. Just stick them up in a in the in the crook of a tree or somewhere in a little pocket and just watch them thrive and bloom. Um, the air plants are very important too. And so now we have some clumping grasses. I think um, I'm going to show you some of the more, some of, hopefully some of the more uncommon ones that you haven't seen before, but the broom sedge um, is very prolific in our natural areas. So I really would love to see this planted more in cultivated landscapes. It's a beautiful backdrop. It's got that feathery wheat look. It kind of blows in the wind. Here's a better picture of it on the right at how thick and feathery it can get. Um, very, very important plant for spiders and little um, insects like that. Now this is uh, the chalky blue stem. And just look at that glaucous blue color. I mean, you can't get any more unique than that. I love putting this plant in front of like an evergreen zamia or uh, some other, or maybe a Florida privet. Um, so they had that deep evergreen that really pulls out and pops that blue green glaucous color of the chalky blue stem. And then this is a small, uh, it looks a little bit like mooly grass, uh, but this is a much smaller uh, genus and species. Um, has a little purple bloom to it. It stays green most of the year. And then it has this very feathery, much more feathery than the mooly grass uh, texture that kind of blows in the wind. And then this is a fakihachi grass. The Trypsicum dactyloides is the larger one. It goes to be at four to five to possibly even six feet tall. Um, and then there's the Trypsicum floridanum, which is kind of the two to three foot height fakihachi grass. And this just goes really good anywhere. Just a really nice flowing um, texture. You can you know, offset it against different textures, but um, it stays evergreen and a uh, really beautiful plant. Now this is related to the um, what we just saw, the Aerogrostis uh, spectabilis, that purple uh, plumage uh, plant. This is the Aerogrostis eleatii that has kind of a pale plumage to it. And now a little bit about vines. The Virginia creeper is, you know, it can be actually used on the ground as a ground cover, but just beware, it does tend to, you have to want it to have a big area to spread in because it will spread. And this is, um, you know, uh, birds really love the berries on the Virginia creeper. And then we have the cross vine, you know, beautiful blooms and um, seeds, very important. Um, hummingbirds will be attracted to this plant as well. And then we have the coral honeysuckle. It's in the vine category. It is a vine. It'll be, it'll climb on, you know, wood privacy fences. But I sometimes I use this plant as a sprawling shrub. It'll get to be about four feet tall. Just let it go. It doesn't have to climb on anything. But the tendencies of the vine will come up and out like a colorful water fountain in your landscape. So a sprawling shrub or a vine. And then uh, this also, if you want to see hummingbirds, this is the plant to plant along with firebush. This is the trumpet vine. Again, beautiful conical you know, blooms. This is more of a music to dry conditions. And then this is the Passiflora suberosa. The, the, the regular big purple passion vine tends to be a little spread too much. And I've been told uh, by our Native Plant Society scientists that the suberosa species actually feeds more uh, insects and wildlife. You can see on the left, it has a very tiny inconspicuous bloom you know, it's compared to that big purple bloom on its the um, the other species, but um, and this will grow um, terrestrially, you know, around along the ground or climb up. Um, it's it's pretty versatile plant and beautiful leaf shape. The Carolina jessamine um, will get thick like this. It prefers some 
not full sun. It prefers a little bit of a dappled shade. And um, this is a wonderful climber, wonderful native vine um, here in Central Florida. Uh, it's Coral Homosic again. And then, so into some native shrubs, I had this slide in here to talk about, you know, there's, there's a lot of the times this need for people and developers and to have this really formal landscape and they say, oh, well, you can't have a formal landscape with natives. Well, in fact, you can. There's uh, our native uh, Viburnum, our the Florida privet, um, Myracanthes, the Simpson stopper, they can all be made to look like very uh, formal pruned hedges. Of course, we don't want to do that because you're kind of cutting out the ecological value of it and the whole point of natives. But I did want to say if you have a need for a formal area, we can certainly do that with natives. Now, probably one of the uh, important shrubs, this is actually a small tree, but it grows so slow and stays, you know, iconic, it's a large shrub, small tree, is the, the uh, hawthorns, the parsley haw. And as, as Craig Hegel will tell us, you know, the some songbirds, you know, they, they don't have any teeth, so they have to swallow the berries whole. And a lot of the times berries are just too big for them. So the pars the haws have really tiny berries, which are um, the favorite of a lot of our songbirds and migratory songbirds in Central Florida. Um, and then we have our pawpaws. Again, there's very limited sp um, pollinators for this. So it's kind of an important plant, kind of a cool looking plant. This is, um, Got a, got a little woody stem with the big, the big, big pawpaw blooms on it. The reticulata is a kind of a smaller species of pawpaw. And then this is a shrub. This is um, with the blooms actually are born on the underside of the stem. So they hang down below the foliage and uh, creating a really beautiful, unique look. Now the uh, Agarista populifolia really craves uh, shade. So, you know, there's a huge variety of native plants for every type of landscape, whether sun, shade, partial shade, morning sun, afternoon sun, there's a native plant available for your space. This prefers a little bit more moist soils, the button bush. Again, look at this unique inflorescence on here. And then, of course, the saw palmetto. If you have an area that's at least 10 to 12 feet wide by 10 to 14 feet wide, you should have a saw palmetto. Um, they're very long lived shrubs. I love the coarse texture to it. Again, it's really nice to contrast things um, in front of it. Um, there's the, um, another species that's the silver saw palmetto that has more of a silverly, silver glaucous blue color to it. And then there's the sable miner, which is kind of looks type of the same, but it's kind of a lot smaller of a plant. And then the sparkleberry gets to be kind of a large shrub, small tree. Very, um, if you can take a look at the top right, a uh, very good uh, berry uh, food and tiny blooms. Um, the gallberry is a beautifully naturally shaped globose uh, shrub that gets to be fairly tall and has that little bit of a, it's evergreen, but a little bit of a lime green light color. Um, and then of course, you know, every landscape should include a firebush. These shrubs get very tall and very wide. They'll get as wide as they are tall. So you have to have a really nice space for it. Um, but this is what um, hummingbirds mainly count on for us in our native plant landscapes. Um, they do prefer a little bit of shade. If you have, if you can't get it, the shade that it needs, you know, you know, plant it maybe on the north side of your house, um, and it'll do a lot better there. And please make sure it's the native shrub, which has the leaves in a world uh, shape of a pattern of three. Um, the the non-native firebush is being pushed out there as a native, and so you really have to kind of be careful. The, the porter plant, the firebush, and some others um, are being 
the, the non-natives are being pushed as natives to, to, to make some sales. So you got to really make sure you go to a native plant nursery to make sure you're getting the native species. So this is our our, our blueberry species in Florida. The, the berries are not very uh, tasty to humans, but boy, do the birds love them. And again, these clusters of the little bluebell type uh, blooms towards the uh, bottom of the leaves makes for a really beautiful display. This tends to be a small shrub, little compact in the bottom end, and then it kind of gets leggy as on the top part. But it's a very feathery uh, type of look to it. And then here's the darrow eye. Again, it's in the blueberry family, the vaccinium uh, genus. And you can see that the leaves are that, that glaucous you know, color again. And this one gets a little taller than the mercenites, the vaccinium mercenites. So now we get into our native viburnums. You know, the typical viburnum you see is native to China. Our native viburnum feeds um, what we have here. Now, this is a very versatile shrub. This is, you know, if you just say, okay, I want a viburnum abovedum, you know, you typically, you could get something and it, it could grow two feet or it can grow to 24 feet. It depends on what variety and cultivar you want. So this is the uh, typical native Walters viburnum shrub. And on the right, it does, if you let it just go, it goes into a tree form. I have one in my yard that's uh, 18 to 20 feet tall. And when it blooms with all the white on and the, and the green, it's just, you know, spectacular. This is not a very good photo, but this is the um, viburnum world class. So this variety gets to be about five to seven feet tall, just a perfect size for a shrub. And what I love about this is you don't, there's no need to prune. It has a natural shape to it. The blooms kind of, you can see where the world, you know, look comes, comes about. Um, and then this one is the Withlacoochee. This will grow up to 14 feet tall. Now keep in mind, this is the same genus and species. It's just a different uh, cultivar. Now it get up to 14 feet tall. And this one, if you can see the habit is more of an inverted umbrella, you know, kind of a uh, more wide at the top versus the world, which was kind of a rounded globose compact. Um, now, if you want to have a native viburnum hedge, this would be the plant for it, the withlacoochee, because it makes a really good hedge at about six to seven feet. It, it'll take a couple of years to get that high, but then you can maintain it at that six to seven feet and it'll look really uh, thick, dense, and beautiful. Now, Reifler's densa, also known as, known as Reifler's dwarf, is a dwarf variety of the viburnum abovedum, and it gets to be about five to six feet tall. Well, we'll just four to six feet tall. And um, again, it has a little bit of a different shape than the world class, uh, but it stays very compact. And then this is the smallest variety, uh, Mrs. Schiller's, um, and it only gets to be about two to three feet tall, very small, very dense, very compact. And now here's another species that has quite a different look with the different cultivars. This is the Ilex vomitoria nana which is a very small shrub, only gets to be about two feet tall. Now this is um, Ilex vimatoria scarlet's peak, which you can see is very, very different. It's columnar. It gets to be about six to eight feet tall and very narrow at the, at the max, three and a half to four feet, but stays around three feet wide, almost looks like an Italian cypress. And you know you can do a lot of unique design ideas with the Scarlet's Peak with that tall columnar shape. I like to put it on the outskirts of a house or a building to kind of elongate that um, elevation look of the house. And I always plant them in groups of three so they look clumped together. So they're not just like one solitary tall thing out there. So groups of three to five go really well with this plant. And then we have the Lyonias. Here's the Lyonia lucida, that fetter bush, um, kind of a loose, coarse habit. Gets to be about a medium-sized shrub, about you know between four and six and a half feet tall. 
This is the Lyonia fruticosa, uh, different colored leaf, and it's um, kind of more of a leggy bush. And then here's Lyonia ferrugiania, the rusty Lyonia. I mean, just look at that color and that texture. This is probably one of the most beautiful shrubs there are. Unfortunately, there's um, people get commercial permits to pluck these out of the wild to put in dry flower arrangements. The floral, the florist nurse uh, industry has pretty much devastated this plant state, statewide because um, there's no limits to how much that they, they can take out of the wild with, if they have a permit. Um, this is one of the most standard uh, native uh, hedges and shrubs, Myracanthes fragrance, the Simpson stopper. Uh, again, this if you let this plant grow, which I recommend, it gets to be kind of like a small tree and has white feathery blooms and uh, fruits on it. And this is St. Andrew's cross, a nice little small shrub. Related to it is the St. John's wort. Um, these take very dry soils and um, but beautiful little blooms on it, really nice texture. This is a uh, another shade plant, but this this shade the shrub will get very tall, 12 to 14 foot. Is the Elysium parviflorum? The uh, common name is Anis, and there's a yellow blooming one and the red blooming one. The yellow blooming one is the native, um, and it again likes a lot of shade and a uh, spice bush. Again, kind of a you have to really look at a lot of these textures. To, because um, they have such unique textures and see what kind of mixes and matches with them with the other shrubs. The spider lily, very delicate, likes a little bit of a shade. And then the scarlet hibiscus is kind of a leggy shrub. It's not very dense, but it is very beautiful. But again, it takes, it grows in swamps. So it takes, you know, maybe near a lake edge or something to keep this plant happy, but just beautiful scarlet blooms on this one. And then this is the Hydrangea quercifolia. It has four different looks um, in the year. It starts out as, you know, evergreen, then it blooms, beautiful white blooms. In the fall, it turns kind of an orange, yellow, and then the leaves from orange, yellow turn to a reddish purple. This is all the same plant with all these different looks. It is deciduous. It does like a lot of shade and some moist uh, soils. Um, again, a glaucus color is the Conradina canescence. And then um, the privet that I've been talking about a little bit earlier, um, you can see the texture on this. Now this will grow very tall in the shade and, um, and planted close enough together could look like, a, it makes a really nice screen if you need to screen a view. The Garberia is very hard to grow in subdivision conditions. It's very picky. You don't see the whole shrub here, but it's basically a three to five foot shrub with you know beautiful pink to lavender type of blooms. Um, uh, it's very valuable, but it as soon as you water it too much, it really it, it doesn't do well. So I just wanted to put it in here because. Um, it, it is kind of a rare shrub. We really need more of them, but it is kind of picky. You really have to pay attention. And then just a few uh, lake edge plants for those that live on lake edges. Um, the cardinal flower is perfect for a lake edge. It, it's, it's upland, but it needs you know to be on um, the moist soil right on the edge of a lake. And then you have maiden cane, looks a lot like the, the, the invasive torpedo grass, but this is a very high, uh, E ecologically valuable plant for waterfowl. And then we have the beautiful uh, pickerel plant that grows in the water, uh, just a little bit submerged. And then the alligator flag, this Thalia geniculata is um, uh, really good food for our waterfowl. And then the blue flag iris is, you know, one of the most beautiful iris, I think one of the only bulbs in Florida, but it takes, it, it grows in very marshy, swampy conditions. And so um, it has to be, you know, in that type of an area by a lake edge um, constantly. It doesn't really like to be dried out. And then the uh, canna gets very tall. This spreads a lot as well, but this plant can get about six to seven feet tall. 
And so we'll round up and end our conversation by just talking about um, some native trees. And then I'll start off with small trees. Um, this is um, uh, an understory tree that grows in the shade of some canopy trees, the Cayenanthus virginicus. There's also the Cayenanthus pygmaeus, uh, the pygmy fringe tree. These are just phenomenal. When you see one in bloom, you know it. It's got this very feathery texture to the bloom. It almost looks like confetti. Um, the beautyberry is a must in every yard. It's kind of a large shrub, small tree. It does get large and kind of fan out umbrella shaped. This is a really important bird food in the fall. Um, salt bush, um, you don't really see this planted a lot, but it's a, a beautiful shrub. It, you know, readily recedes. It gets up to about, you know, 12, 14 feet tall and beautiful white blooms. The Hercules tree is one of the, mo the few trees that are actually a butterfly uh, nectar plant, feeds a lot of pollinators. And it just has a beautiful, very unique shape. But again, uh, it has, you can see on the left, very uh, thorny on the branches and trunk. So just a little bit of care there. And then this is one of our endangered species that is actually available in cultivation. So the more we can go to native plant nurseries and find plants that are endangered, but that they're actually growing to put back in our home landscapes, you know, the better off we'll have a chance at saving biodiversity. So wrapping up here, here's our native prune tree, our plum tree. Uh, wax myrtle feeds the most number of birds. It's kind of a small to medium sized tree. Uh, Yaupon holly tree. The high bush blueberry. Um, it's another uh, in the blueberry family, but gets to be a little taller than the other little small shrubs that I showed earlier. Kind of a small tree type looking shrub. And now we go to sub canopy um, for really wet soils. The sweet bag Sweet Bay Magnolia has a really beautiful uh, bloom, a little smaller miniature bloom of the Magnolia Grandiflora. The Dahoon Holly it looks beautiful in the wintertime with the red berries. Now the Myrtle Oak is, this is kind of a, not a very good picture, but is very sculpturesque. You know, oak trees don't have to be 60 feet tall. This tree gets only 15 to 18 feet tall and it's absolutely beautiful. The sand live oak gets a little taller and still has that sculpturesque look to it. The elderberry, it's a little um, weak wooded, but it feeds a lot. And then just wrapping up, um, this is an underplanted tree, the Celtis laevigata, the hackberry or sugarberry. Um, really, it's a beautiful tree for parking lots, your front yard. It, it is deciduous, but um, it's got a really sculpturesque bark, really underplanted tree. The red cedar, again, is good for birds um, to, to hide in. Um, the black cherry is, it tends to be a little invasive, but it's the most highly rated tree for wildlife. And then this tree, the water oak, is never planted, it has such a very short lifespan, only like 45 to 55 years um, versus our live oak, which can live up to 650 years. So people are hesitant to plant it because it'll have to come down you know, within a, a generation. Um, but look at the spatulate look to the leaf. It's a very unique tree. You know, If you have a big open area or a park, it's, it's a nice tree to plant. Some of our um, uh, water uh, plants that you can plant in lakes are the water tupelo or the black gum, beautiful fall color there. And then here are some of our pines. The longleaf pine is our most popular, but we also have pond pine, very different look to it, but it likes a very moist swampy soil. The, the sand pine couldn't be more different, very dry soils it needs, but it's very feathery texture and then the loblolly pine. And of course, um, uh, an important, our state tree, um, sable palms should be in every landscape. Um, the berries are an important um, food source for a lot and they're just you know beautiful palm trees. Now I'm just gonna go through this section. This is just, we're almost finished here. This is a section um, where if you have a traditional plant, I have a native uh, substitute. So for, 
the sago plants, which have a lot of scale problems, you can plant the Florida Kunti. And instead of liriope, you could plant blue-eyed grass, same border, um, uh, grass border type look. Uh, ligustrum trees, which are now invasive, you can plant a wax myrtle, same kind of shape, look. The tea plant, it, you can get the color from a goldenrod. The crinum, you can plant our native swamp lily. Um, and, and please, let's not plant any more crepe myrtles. We have a native flatwood plant that has, that's deciduous, about the same size, blooms. We need to stop doing the monoculture of planting crepe myrtles and get some of our native uh, prune trees, plum trees out there. Instead of oleander, which attracts um, uh, insects that you have to spray because it'll eat the plant till it's dead, you can plant firebush. Instead of plumbago, you can plant or Walter's viburnum. Instead of the small Indian hawthorn, you can plant gallberry. And, you know, so just to end here, um, everybody knows the importance of native plants and um, hopefully this has helped you a little bit to see, give you a, a peek on the window of what's available at our Central Florida Native Plant Nurseries. On the screen here, I'm listing the top three in this Central Florida area. If you, you can find them online and give them a call um, and they're very helpful and you'll be able to get, you know, all sorts of information when you purchase your plants. Okay, well, thank you for joining me. Um, it's been about an hour, so we'll end here. Um, if anybody has any questions, um, you can let Valerie know and we can try to answer those for you. Let me get my mic on there. Hi, everyone. Um, we don't have too many, too many questions in the, let me scroll through. Uh, our first question is from Rhonda. Uh, she asks if phyla nidiflora is salt tolerant. It is to a certain extent. Yeah, you can. I've seen it in Brevard County on the coast. Yes, but you might not want it, say, in a completely salt exposed landscape or like with salty groundwater. It, right. Most of the plants, the the coastal um, areas are very specialized plants, very unique. It's best to go to a native plant nursery in that that area and ask them for the salt tolerant plant list. Right. And I'd like to point out that we have a plant finder on FNPS.org and one of the criteria is salt tolerance. So if you see a plant here that fits your criteria, you think about what those criteria are, say maybe a ground cover, um, you know, butterfly nectar plant, put that into, into the criteria, but, all in, but also check salt tolerance so you can get a similar plant that will be suitable for your location because really you plant, a, you plant a plant that's not salt salt tolerant and you're, uh, it's not going to survive if you it, put it in a very it, salt it, area. Just click the box for salt tolerance and all of those salt tolerant plants will come up in your area. So it's a good tool on www.fnps.org. Yes, and there was a discussion in the chat about the use of words aggressive and invasive. And um, so when you're discussing native plants, native plants cannot be invasive because they're, yeah, yes. they're native but there are aggressive natives and thus the the need to um, make a personal choice when it comes to say for example biden's alba so some people pull up all the biden's alba in their landscapes and they intentionally plant you know uh, less aggressive natives for a more neat look other people encourage their biden's alba or um, as natalie van hern who does um, trims it into a hedge that her <laughs> hoa doesn't mind uh, so dealing with these sorts of gardening issues with with uh, natives and their their growth habits and their use of resources that's an important thing to learn uh, based on your site and its history and seed bank and you know soil conditions yeah um, we had a question about key west vine which i wasn't familiar with that common name for um, uh, sky blue cluster vine jacamontia Yes, um, I I have used it. It tends to be aggressive. We'll use that word aggressive. Um, here, they pr pretty much took over the surrounding area. Um, it is a good pollinator plant, but again, um, I mean, if you're taking it out of its context in South Florida and bringing it up here, it just behaves a little differently. Mm -hmm. um, so what exactly was the question? They just is wanted it, to know if it was native. 
It is native. Yeah. It is native, yes. And let's see. So we had a few um, scientific name corrections. So you use some of the Midwestern analogs for our oh, native okay. species, uh, which I'll is later yeah. common when you're dealing with you know landscape plants so uh, right. like, for example ver the vernonia the iron weeds we don't have fasciculata um, but we do have um, we do have angustifolia we have tall iron weed and we have a couple other iron weeds that i had open yeah gig gigantia so giant iron weed and tall mm -hmm. iron weed and then we have a couple of others that i don't think are in the nursery trade like acolis and vernonia blagedii Blodgett's ironweed and Vernonia miserica, Missouri ironweed. They're probably panhandle ones that I'm not familiar with. We don't have well, them. That Florida. one was on there, but go ahead. Go ahead. Um, and then let's see. Oh yeah, the the starry rosin weeds, the rosin weeds. We don't have the integrifolium. That's a Midwest one, but we do have um, Asteriscus and Compositum. So if you if you saw a plant on here and you want to make sure you have the right scientific name. Our website, the plant finder, is specific for commercially available natives. We don't have a lot of like rare natives on our plant mm -hmm. finder. So if you are wondering about, you want to make sure you have your plant list right, plant list right before you go to the nursery, check there. Um, let's see. Diane Goldberg puts in a plug for Passiflora suberosa, or it, there's maybe reclassification. It might be Passiflora pallida um, here in in Florida, but anyways. It looks the same. It's very common. It's got those um, the leaves that are heterophilous, so some some leaves are different shapes than others, and it's got that corky stem. And she says the bird loves the birds love to eat the berries and spread it around, and it's great for butterflies. You see both the zebra long wings, and the um, oh, what are the other ones? Oh, I blanked. Mm. Anyways, two kinds of butterflies on that one. Uh, a question about if it's necessary to trim muley grass after it flowers? Uh, it's not necessary to trim it. Um, after a couple of seasons, if it's a small area, I would burn it, have a hose nearby and just burn it and let it come back fresh. Um, that's the best maintenance for muley grass. When you cut it, when you cut it you're taking the new and the old, you're leaving all of that dead thatch in a really weird shape and it, it doesn't, it, it'll grow back and you'll have it, the thick dead stuff will stay in there. So the best way, if you have a large expanse of it, you know, maybe go ahead and prune it, but the best way is just to burn it. Yeah. And, you know, if you have to, because you're trying to keep it neat or you have an HOA, you know, you're mm -hmm. not going to kill it by, by clipping it back every year. Mm -hmm. But if you could, you know, maybe clip it back every other year, um, yeah, that would be more ideal. No, it definitely doesn't need to be cut back. There's no, there's no need that it has for that. Um, Evan Earl Jr. weighed in that he's had problems with suckers and runners with Walter's viburnum. Um, yeah, depending on what species and um, I, it, I, I have heard that. I haven't had that problem, um, but you just have to, it, with suckers and runners on some species, the more you cut them, the more they're going to come back. So I, I would just leave what you have, you know, is my opinion, because I have seen those conditions where you try to cut them and then it just spurs more of them. There's some of the natives that do sucker quite um, vigorously. So the, mm -hmm. the plums. Uh, the, the, yeah, the Chickasaw plum will sucker it immediately all the time and consistently. The, that's the, um, the prunus angustifolia. Now, the prunus umbellata, the native prune tr plum tree, um, does not sucker as much. And that's the flatwoods plum. A Simpson stopper, Mercianthes fragrans, that's also a pretty substantial plant mm, that does. Not 100%, though. It, it suckers, but not 100% of the time. Let's see. Okay. Um... Okay, what do you recommend for a lake buffer plant, a two foot tall lake buffer plant? Yeah, uh, the cardinal plant that I showed is the lake edge plant. Um, the, uh, some of the clumping grasses um, will take the water on the lake edge. Uh, the canna lilies will, is our good lake edge plant. Um, 
that section that I had in there. Um, there's a lemon bacopa if you want just a little um, ground cover near your lake edge. Oh, you want two foot. Uh, the two foot would um, would be that Lobelia cardinalis, with the red bloom. Then there's also the uh, the native hibiscus. We'll get a little it's taller little tall. than that. A little taller than that, but um, well, the scarlet hibiscus. I mean, that'll get five or six feet tall. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe a little, maybe a little tall. Um, so Marilyn is asking if we know a good resource for propagating native plants from seed. So like a how-to guide, Marilyn, I think. The best one I know of is the, um, there's a native plant propagation page group on Facebook. So if you just mm -hmm. search for that, that's, I think, mm -hmm. I think that's where the best discussion I've seen going on right now. Um, uh, Jean is asking for a native plant book reference. Um, let's see, there's a lot of them. There's one by Rufino Orsorio, um, uh, native, native Plants of Florida. There's one by um, Edward Gilman from the University of Florida about native trees. There's one a book about wildflowers by Walter Taylor. Um, Wildflowers of Florida, it's called. Um, I think I think I have before. If you go on uh, Amazon and search for Florida native plant books, they'll pro there's probably twelve to fifteen books for Florida native plants that will come up. Yes, and we have. I put in the chat a link to our book recommendations. So we have mm -hmm. them sorted by butterflies and pollinators, ecosystem plant communities, human uses of plants, including ethnobotany. And we have a whole landscape and gardening section with five, 10, 14 recommendations for books. So pop onto you know, our, our website there and uh, then you have your recommendations. Um, let's see, um, Dennis asked if I can recommend areas where native plant landscape designs are in place. Yes, we have a map for that, Dennis, on our website. So if you go to our website and you go to native plants in the drop down and gardens with natives, we have a map of native plant gardens and I've just dropped that link in the chat for uh, everyone to look at. And I would like to put in a plug for the Florida Native Plant Society because the best place to learn is to spend $35 and get our quarterly uh, uh, color magazine, a monthly newsletter, uh, chapter speakers online now. Um, and then your funding also goes to help preserve and conserve native ecosystems in Florida. Um, so the, the best thing to do is just join us and, and, and continue to learn um, that way. And yes, someone popped in that Biosphere has closed. So unfortunately that is i i thought i i heard that um a couple of months ago that there was a rumor about that i'm sorry to hear that yeah it's really sad that their land got sold mm -hmm. um yes okay so anyone who wants to request the pdf i'm dropping my i'm dropping my email in the chat and karina you'll send me the pdf when we're done or yeah, just... and I'll correct, I'll correct those uh, species that were uh, incorrect on there before we send it out. Okay, yeah, so everybody can send me an email. I'll put all the emails together, and then when Karina gets done correcting the slides, I'll, uh, I'll get those out for you guys. Um, let's see, I think that is... Oh, thank you, everyone, for letting me know about Gulf Fritillary. Thanks, Diane and Lily. <laughs> I can't believe I forgot. Um, And I think that's it. So right. thank you everyone for attending. Thanks, I'm, everyone. I'm sorry we went a little bit long. If anyone wants a PDF, please, communications at fmps.org. Thank you, Karina, for uh, presenting to us and sure. you know, working so hard for our chapter and volunteering to present. And, All right, uh, bye everybody. Have a great rest of the day. Bye everyone.